right, so during the eighth century BC, a long time ago, eighth century BC, the Lord, Yahweh, he revealed himself or he appeared uh, to Jonah, his servant, and he said this. This is chapter one, verse two. He said, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. Call out, the idea there is to preach. Call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. God says to Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go, and Jonah, I want you to preach. Now, it's been a few weeks since I've been up here, and so uh, by way of quick review, who was Jonah? Jonah was an Old Testament prophet, and um, he was uh, prophesying, giving the word of the Lord to the 10 northern tribes of Israel. And then what was Nineveh? Nineveh was a massive metropolitan area in the um, Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire was one of the world powers of the day, and the Assyrian Empire was a huge threat to Israel. And so Jonah did not like this assignment from God. And the reason why is because the Assyrians had a really bad reputation. These people were vicious, they were cruel, they had a reputation for cruelty and violence, and they did horrendous things to their enemies. And Jonah, well Jonah was a, a patriotic guy. He loved his country, and quite frankly, he despised um, this big bully to the northeast. And so if you imagine the map, 8th century BC, you've got uh, Egypt, uh, e Egypt, the Egyptian empire is here, and then you go up, you got uh, Judah, and then you got the 10 tribes of Israel here, and then you continue to go northeast, and what do you have? You have the growing Assyrian empire, Nineveh would be in modern day Iraq. And so Jonah, a patriotic Hebrew, he felt threatened by the big bully. He didn't like them. He didn't like the assignment. You see, the difference between God and Jonah was this. God loved the Assyrians. Just like he loved everybody. Just like he still, John 3, 16, so loves the entire world. And so God wanted the Ninevites to repent. Jonah, on the other hand, Jonah hated. He was bitter towards the Assyrians and he wanted them to be destroyed. And so instead of obeying God, he ran from God. If you were with us the first four messages, uh, you know the story, but God said go. Jonah said no, he gets on a ship. He's heading towards what we would call now southern Spain. They endure a severe storm at sea, and then the next thing you know, um, Jonah is discovered as the cause of the storm. The next scene, you have these scared, soaked sailors, these polytheistic pagan sailors, and they pick up Jonah, and it's like, see you later, and there goes Jonah. Now here's, here, here's uh, one of the miracles in the book of Jonah. As soon as Jonah hits the waves, what happens? A crazy situation, right? This is a fierce storm. A crazy situation immediately turns to complete calm. What had been a very turbulent scene turns into a very tranquil scene. And that, ladies and gentlemen, causes these pagan sailors to be absolutely in awe of the one true God, the Lord, the God of Israel, Yahweh God. Now, even though above the water it was peaceful, below the water it's anything but peaceful. And so here's Jonah, right, and he's sinking down, sinking, sinking, and the next thing you know, he looks over, and there's a, what the Bible calls a great fish. You remember uh, weeks ago, we talked about how it could be a sperm whale, uh, large enough throat to do this. We don't know, it could have been a special creation from God. Nonetheless, we know it happened. Uh, one of the reasons we know it happened is because Jesus said it happened. All right, and so whatever Jesus says, as Dr. Frank Turek said last week, anybody who rises from the dead, I'm gonna believe everything the guy says. So we believe what Jesus said, and he said Jonah was real, we believe Jonah was real. And so the next thing you know, Jonah is being sucked into the mouth of this great fish. He's gotta be so shocked. But a few moments later, he's so thankful 
when he's inside the fish because he realizes, I'm still breathing. I'm still conscious. I got two legs, two arms, 10 fingers. You know, this is crazy. But how can this be? But I am alive. But then he probably thinks, what's gonna happen next? Right, am I gonna be digested? Maybe it's time to pray. And the prodigal prophet from chapter one becomes the praying prophet in chapter two, and Jonah finally gets right with the Lord. And so Jonah's beautiful prayer, recorded in chapter two, it ends with this beautiful truth. You can look at it, chapter two, end of verse nine. Jonah says from the belly of the whale, salvation belongs to the Lord. That is such an important truth. Ladies and gentlemen, hear it again. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And so just as Jonah could not save himself, he could not get out of the belly of the great fish on his own. He needed the Lord to save him physically. Just like that, spiritually speaking, all mankind, guess what? We cannot save ourselves. But how many of you are glad that the Lord has provided a way of salvation? He has, and we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about that at the end of the message. And so as the great fish, right, Jonah is in its belly. As it's speeding across the Mediterranean Sea, after three days, it feels the urge to regurge. And so what does it do? It beaches itself on the shore, and the next thing you know, blah, right? And out tumbles Jonah on the shore. Can you imagine if there was any fishermen around <laughs> casting their nets that day? It's like, hey, look, it's a beached whale. Why is it moving back and forth? And then all of a sudden, blah, and it's like, oh, whoa, what just came out of it? Is that a man? And there is Jonah in a puddle of puke right there on the shore. Now, I read a lot this week um, in preparation, and a lot of these commentators say that because Jonah was exposed to the gastric juices or stomach acids within the belly of the whale, that his skin would have been bleached white. And he would probably would have been hairless. And so now picture the scene, there in a puddle of puke on the shore, there's this smelly, slimy, bleached white, hairless Hebrew. <laughs> there he is, there's Jonah. What's the, uh, one of the moral of the stories? Don't run from God, no I'm just kidding, right? And so, and so now Jonah, right, he's so grateful, he's so thankful to be alive, and what does he do then? Listen, after everything he had been through, I think you know what he does now. He's determined, I'm gonna obey God. I'm gonna go to Nineveh, and I'm gonna preach. And that leads you to your outline for the book. Once again, chapter one, the prodigal prophet. Chapter two, the praying prophet. Chapter three is today, the preaching prophet. Prophet, and then finally, when we get back later to Jonah, when we get to chapter four, the petulant or the pouting prophet. All right, so let's dig in. Right now, if you're looking at chapter three, verse one, can you say amen? amen. And so we're just gonna go verse by verse through the chapter today. If you're new to Calvary, uh, welcome. Uh, this is what we do most of the time. We just teach God's word. And so, chapter three, verse one. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. How many of you are glad for second chances? The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, the message that I tell you. Does that sound familiar, by the way, in verse two? Well, yeah, it should, because it's basically the same message God gave him back in chapter one, verse two. And so it says in verse one of chapter three, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And that leads you to your next point, uh, if you wanna take notes uh, today, and that is that God, 
who has an unlimited supply of grace and mercy will give a second chance to those who turn back to him. I love this. God will give people a second chance. And so maybe you're here or maybe you're watching and you've been running from the Lord. Perhaps you think, man, I've gone too far. I've sinned too big. I can't come back. I want you to listen to my words this morning. Nothing could be further from the truth. Listen, no matter where you have been or no matter what you have done, the Father loves you and he's waiting for you with open arms and he's ready to forgive you and he's ready to restore you. That is God's heart. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God of the Old Testament. That's the God of the New Testament. He's the same God. And listen, when you read the Bible, you see this over and over. When you start in the beginning of your Bible, you see <clears throat> Adam and Eve. And what, is, what happens with Adam and Eve? They blow it, they sin. And then what do they do? They run away from the presence of the Lord. But what, how does God respond? Does God say, fine, forget you? No, God goes after them. He goes looking for them and he finds them in the garden and he gives them a second chance. You keep reading the Bible and you come to Moses and the next thing you know, Moses looks to the left, he looks to the right and boom, he strikes down and kills the Egyptian. He hides the body in the sand because he, know, he, he knows he's done wrong. And when it's found out, he's running to Midian. How does God respond? Does God say, fine, forget you? No, God later goes looking for Moses. He finds him on the backside of a desert. He appears to him in a burning bush. God gave Moses a second chance. Ladies and gentlemen, I want our church to be a church that preaches and teaches grace. I want our church to be a church that preaches the right view of God. This is the heart of God revealed in the scriptures. When you keep reading, you come to David. David. And what's he doing? Well, instead of being out in warfare with his fellow soldiers, he's taking it easy on the roof of his palace. He looks down, he sees another man's wife bathing. And what does David do? He makes a choice. How many of you guys know it's always a choice? He makes a choice to give in to his lust. And the next thing you know, that very night, he's committing adultery um, with another man's wife. And then later, what does he do? He gives the order to have her husband killed. He's like, hey, General Joab, while you're out there on the battlefield, I want you to put Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, on the front lines. And when the battle really gets fierce, I want you guys to back away so that Uriah is killed in battle. And Joab does that, Uriah is dead. David's not just an adulterer, David's a murderer. How does God respond? Well, forget you. No, God goes after him. He sends his prophet Nathan to confront. He doesn't wink at his sin. No, you know, listen, God will confront us with our sin. And Nathan confronted David with his sin and that led to David's repentance and his forgiveness and his restoration. David got a second chance. You keep reading the Bible, you come to the New Testament, now you got Peter. And what does Peter do? Not once, not twice, but three times he denies the Lord Jesus in the Lord's most difficult hour. What does the Lord do? Forget you, no. After he rises from the dead, he goes looking for Peter. The resurrected Christ appears to Peter, why? Because he loves the guy, he wants to restore the guy. He's like, Peter, I want you uh, to feed my lambs. Peter, I want you to tend my sheep. Peter, I want you to feed my sheep. Now why does Jesus basically say the same thing three times? It's because Peter denied Jesus how many times? Yeah, he's restoring Pastor Pete 
to the ministry. This is God's heart. God is a God of second chances. Over and over in the Bible, we see this truth. So again, if you're thinking, it's too late for me. I've sinned too big. I've been running too long. I want you to consider this. If the Lord gave Adam and Eve and Moses and David and Peter and Jonah a second chance, why would the one who has unlimited grace and unlimited mercy, why would he treat you any different? Listen to the word of God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1, 9. Here's my encouragement, whether you're here in the room or watching. If you're running from the Lord, stop, turn around. God is waiting with his arms open wide to receive you and to forgive you and to restore you just like he did for Jonah. He's the God of the second chance. Now, it says in chapter three, verse one, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out, preach against it, the message that I tell you. Now that's very interesting. We have to pause there for a moment. In other words, Jonah, I don't want you to preach the message that you wanna preach. I want you to preach the message that I tell you. And that leads you to your next point, if you're taking notes, and that is when evangelizing the lost or discipling the found, ladies and gentlemen, there's no better word than God's word. No better word than God's word. And so in our day, you know this, too many pastors have abandoned the preaching and the teaching of God's word for the sharing of their own opinions. And so in some places, biblical preaching and teaching have been replaced with speaking on social issues, preaching on politics, or talking about how to have a happy life. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with discussing social issues. There's nothing wrong with discussing politics, and there's certainly nothing wrong with being happy. I mean, if you wanna be happy, raise your hand. I'll raise two, right? We all wanna be happy, but there's a time and a place for everything. There's a time and a place for those kinds of discussions. Now, I have very limited time with you guys every single weekend. And so if you haven't noticed it yet, for 17 and a half years, it's my very strong conviction that during our limited time on the weekends, I'm gonna give you what you need the most spiritually, and that is the word of God. That's, that's always been my conviction. That was my conviction when my wife and I and our three girls, when they were little, came to Port St. Lucie way back in 2004. We're just gonna teach God's word feed God's sheep. Regarding um, this topic, O.S. Hawkins, he said, pulpits are not private platforms to espouse personal philosophies or political views. The only preaching God honors is the message I give you. He's quoting straight from the book of Jonah. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying topical messages are wrong. And so here at Calvary, there's times as the Spirit leads where we'll pause our verse-by-verse -verse teaching through God's word, and we will, as pastors, share a topic that the Lord has put on our heart. That is a good thing as long as the message is biblically based and biblically centered. But when it comes to personal philosophies or people's opinions about social issues or politics, we don't embrace those kinds of messages. You say, well, what do you embrace? This right here. This is what we embrace. We embrace the scriptures. Now, listen, you say, what do you base all this on? Maybe you're new to the Bible. This is what we base this on. Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Literally breathed out 
by God. You cannot improve on that. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God, it's anthropos, it's, it's human being. So the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now I had a little aha moment this week as I'm studying because like obviously that, that verse, I've known it for years and years and years. It is the last verse in 2 Timothy chapter three. And because we have chapter divisions in our Bibles, we often read that last verse in 2 Timothy chapter three, and then we close our Bibles. How many of you guys know there's no chapter divisions in the original manuscript that Paul wrote to Timothy? It just continues to flow. So do you know what the very next thing that Paul said to his young protege? Right here. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. And I want you to say the next three words. Go ahead. You see how it flows? Timothy. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then he goes, preach the word. It just flows. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Why, Paul? Here's why. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. By the way, that time is here. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into what? Myths. Timothy, in the future, people are not gonna put up with sound teaching from the word of God. But Timothy, here's what you need to know. It's not about what people wanna hear, it's about what they need to hear. So you need to preach the word. Paul's an apostle, Timothy's a pastor of a local church, the apostles telling the pastor, preach the word. I don't know how much clearer I can make it and so this is so important. Timothy's congregation in the New Testament, the Ninevites in the Old Testament, all people everywhere, they need to hear a message from the Lord. And so now in Jonah chapter three, verse three, it goes on to say this. So God gives him the call. I want you to go to Nineveh, I want you to preach. Verse three, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, yes, <laughs> he's obeying the Lord now. This is good, this is really, really good. And so um, if you, as you think um, uh, through this, I want you to imagine now Jonah is entering into Nineveh. These people are Assyrians. What do they have a reputation for? Cruelty, violence. When they don't like you, they skin you alive, they impale you on a pole. And so Jonah is going now into Nineveh, halfway down verse three. It says, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breath. And so commentators say the idea here is that it would take three days to walk around the circumference of the greater Nineveh area with its suburbs and its lands. In other words, Nineveh was a massive metropolitan area, and since chapter four, verse 11, says that it had 120,000 little kids, you know, who don't even know the difference between their left hand and their right hand. If you do the math, if you got 120,000 little kids, you do the math, um, scholars estimate that it's about 600,000 plus people in this major metropolitan area. And so now we go to verse four. It says, Jonah began to go into the city. I'm sure he's looking over his shoulder. <laughs> he's going a day's journey. And then he calls out. 
Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And he's wondering what's going to happen next. <laughs> now, we'll get there in a moment. The response of the people um, in verses five and following is so amazing. Here's what I've concluded. I've concluded that short statement found at the end of verse four, made up of eight English words and five Hebrew words. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I personally believe that is obviously not the only thing Jonah said. Based on the amazing response, I think he said a lot more, a lot more about the true God, Yahweh, a lot more about the need to put their trust in him. Did he also tell them about his venture at sea? Did he tell them about being swallowed by a whale? Did he tell them about being puked out on the beach? You know, did they look at his bleached skin as proof for his story? We don't know, we're not sure about any of that. But what we are sure of is this right here. So if you're listening, say amen. amen. Jonah told them about God and God's judgment. Jonah told them about the true God and he did not hold back from talking about God's judgment and that leads you to your next point. If you're taking notes, Jonah didn't hold back from warning people. Do you guys know that this is part of what we're called to do here? Jonah didn't hold back from warning people about God's judgment. He says, yet 40 days and Nineveh is gonna be overthrown. Now that Hebrew word, overthrown, is used in other places in the Old Testament for God's judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, and so we're right around 760 BC in our Bibles. If you back up about 1,200 years and you come to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, yes, it really happened in history. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Genesis chapter 19 says this, then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he, listen to the word, overthrew, that's the same Hebrew word that we just read in Jonah, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. And so just like Sodom and Gomorrah were judged, so Nineveh would also be judged perhaps not by fire, but judged nonetheless, unless the people believed God. And if their faith was genuine, it would be manifested by them turning away from their evil ways. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonah did not hold back from sharing God's judgment in the eighth century BC, and you and I cannot hold back from sharing about God's judgment in our modern day either. Here's the truth. If anybody rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ, they will experience God's judgment. As I'm preparing the message this week, this is one of the things the Lord spoke to my heart about. Now, don't believe it because God spoke to my heart. Believe it because it's in the Bible. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so what is he saying? He's saying if you wanna get to the Father in heaven, you gotta go through the Son. How? By placing your faith in Jesus. But if you reject Jesus Christ, the only alternative is judgment because you'll die in your sins. This is a verse that everybody should memorize and you can use it as the Lord opens doors and as you share the, the gospel. And by the way, uh, before you can share the good news, you got to be faithful and share the bad news. And when people know the bad news, the good news looks all the better. But listen to this verse, you should memorize it. It's Acts chapter four, verse 12. Peter, he says this, and I quote, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. How much clearer can you get than that? And so once again, um, 
Acts chapter four, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You say, saved from what? Saved from God's judgment for our sins. Saved from hell. Did you know that even the most famous verse in the New Testament clearly reveals that God's judgment is coming if people reject Christ? The most famous verse. You're gonna see it this afternoon. Someone's gonna hold up a sign in an end zone in a lot of stadiums around America. And what is the sign gonna say? For God, it's gonna say John 3.16, but here's what John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not, what's the word? Perish. Perish. You see, it's right there in the most famous verse in the Bible. Should not perish, but have eternal life. And so the divine message is not complicated. If anybody wants eternal life, they have to put their trust in him. They have to believe in him, the one, the only one who paid the price for their sins on the cross, died in their place, and rose again the third day. But if somebody rejects the gospel, if someone rejects Jesus, they will perish. I just wonder, do we really believe that? Or have we bought into some kind of universalism where everybody's gonna die and everybody's gonna be fine forever in quote unquote heaven? That's not what the Bible teaches. Now, even though they didn't have the full revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ back in 760 BC in Jonah's day, the people, the Ninevites, were still responsible to respond in faith to the prophet's message, and I thank God they did that. And so now, we are gonna read about what some people say is the greatest spiritual awakening in the history of the world. So if you're looking at Jonah chapter three, verse five, can you say amen so I know you're there? Okay, so check this out. So Jonah preaches, right? And instead of being skinned alive or impaled on a pole, (laughs) It says, and the people of Nineveh, now go ahead and shout out the next few words. There it is. By the way, how many of you guys know that that doesn't happen outside of the power of God? Doesn't happen outside the power of God. This is the power of God, anointing the man of God as he preaches the word of God. And the people of Nineveh believed God and they called for a fast and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And the word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he removed his robe and he covered himself with sackcloth and he sat down in ashes. This is the head guy. Verse seven, and he issued a proclamation and published throughout Nineveh By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not, what's the word, perish. So apparently, the faith of the Ninevites was genuine because it was manifested by godly action. You say, what godly action? Fasting. Wearing sackcloth. If you're new to the Bible, sackcloth was basically a garment made of goat's hair. It was coarse, it was very uncomfortable, but it was a symbol, when you put it on, of repentance and mourning. Sitting in ashes, that's a symbol of anguish and despair. A fervent prayer. This is not you know, a little, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul. They're crying out to God all throughout this massive city and a turning away from sin. The king did those things, the people did those things, and they even made their animals do those things. They're so serious, they're putting sackcloth on cows out in the field. 
And so why did they do all this? Why did they respond in this way? Well, we just read it, beginning of verse five. They believed God. And so once again, one of the greatest spiritual awakenings in history. And how many of you guys would love to see a spiritual awakening in our day? Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be wonderful? It would be so amazing and so wonderful if there was a revival, a true revival in the church, churches across America, because I really believe that would lead to a spiritual awakening in our society. Now, how does the Lord respond to all this? It says in verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. And I say, <laughs> what a gracious and what a merciful God. And that leads you to your last point as we start to wind down the message here this morning, and that is the same heart that the Lord had in Jonah's day is the same heart he has today. Second Peter 3, 9. Now I know a lot of you know that verse by heart, some of you don't, and so basically 2 Peter 3, 9, it says that the Lord is patient, and it says that he's not willing that any should perish, okay? So perish uh, is the same Greek word as the word perish in John three sixteen. And so God's patient, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all, should come to repentance, repentance. Now, what I wanna make sure that you guys understand is what does the word repentance mean? So if you're listening right now, can you say amen? amen. Stay with me all the way to the end because it's, it's just really important. The word repentance in the Greek is metanoia and according to uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon, it means, quote, a change of mind. Repentance in the New Testament, metanoia, a change of mind. Now, what's the relationship between repentance and faith? Well, three or four weeks ago, I didn't have a coin, I just had a cough drop, but this time I brought a really nice coin. All right, and so repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. So think about it, we'll start with the first side. Repentance is a change of mind. And so you have a lost person, and that lost person is confronted with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what happens? What happens is they change their mind about their sin. They think, my sin is wrong. My sin offends God. The penalty of my sin it's death. I need forgiveness. They change their mind about their sin. They change their mind about themselves. Listen to this. I can't save myself. I can't do good works and hope that I'm gonna merit heaven. Doesn't happen. I can't save myself. They change their mind about their sin, they change their mind about themselves, and they change their mind about the Savior. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. Jesus Christ really did leave his throne in heaven, and he came on a mission to seek and save the lost. Who's that? Everybody in the world. And so Jesus Christ, the eternal God, what did he do? He entered time and space through a virgin's womb. He added a, uh, um, he added a human nature to his already eternally uh, existing divine nature. God became man. We're gonna celebrate it in a, few week, a couple weeks here. The incarnation, God became man. 100% God, 100% man. And so Jesus comes, and what does he do? He, he, he lives that perfect life that none of us could live. And then as the Lamb of God, he goes to the cross. And what does he do? He pays the penalty of death for our sins on the cross and he rises from the dead. 
So there's a change of mind about these things. Now listen to this. Based on the truth of the gospel, now we come to the other side of the coin, faith. And so now this person, what do they do? They place their faith in Jesus Christ and they receive him as the, as the Lord and the savior of their life. John 1.12 says this. Um, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. And so that person gets saved. They think, I'm forgiven. Man, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. Now, what does that salvation result in? Well, it results in, um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Listen to this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. And so salvation results in a changed life. Is this making sense to you guys? Okay, so Paul put it this way. He says, for by grace are we saved through faith. And that's not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. And so, what does salvation result in? It says in the very next verse, for we, Christian, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so true faith in Jesus Christ manifests itself in good works. And I wanna make sure no one misunderstands, right? Because I think there's so much misunderstanding on this right here. We do not do good works to be saved. We do good works because we're saved, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Is that, do you guys believe that? Absolutely. Absolutely. 